All right. Hi, guys. It's Dave here from Metal Roos, and I'm with our longtime member, Ben Ward of Orange Goblin. How are you going, mate? Yeah, I'm very well. Yeah. Uh, nice, miserable Tuesday morning here in London. Um, it's always miserable it, there, isn't it? It is, yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> but, um, you know, halfway through my uh, morning of press with Australia and uh, having a good time, meeting some nice people. Ah, that's really good. Really good. You uh, you enjoy the Australian people? Do yeah, I, I, I think you know we have a lot in common with the Australian people. We all, we like sports. We like to drink. We like to rock and roll, and uh, yeah. yeah, have a good time. <laughs> Most of my family is actually from London, but uh, yeah, I was born here. But yeah, right, okay, yeah, that's where I am at the moment in London, and it's uh, it's grim. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um. So Orange Goblin started 1995 under under a different name, but uh, 96 it changed to Orange Goblin. Is that right? It's yeah, absolutely true. Formed a band and gave ourselves the name Our Haunted Kingdom in the first place because we were more of a death doom metal band. Um, we were young. I, we weren't. I weren't. I wasn't confident as a singer, so I just sort of did the death metal growling. Yeah. Um, when we was kind of heavily influenced by the likes of early paradise lost and my dying bride and anathema and stuff like that as yeah, well yeah. as you know obviously a lot of the death metal at the time like obituary and carcass napalm death day aside cannibal corpse and things like that so you know and then as we kind of matured as a band we we realized that that wasn't our forte it wasn't what we wanted to do um yeah, yeah. and the 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 band that's kind of shaped us was Black Sabbath and and yeah. then from from a love of Black Sabbath we we started discovering stuff like Saint Vitus and Pentagram Candlemas the Obsessed and and a lot of this sort of Lee Dorian turned us onto a lot of stuff like seventies obscure seventies rock bands that yeah. um, that kind of dictated the the way we want the path we wanted to take and and our sound changed so we figured the the name change was uh, was a no brainer and Orange Goblin came about because we we loved Tolkien um, and goblins stood out as a mischievous little creature and then the orange came from that one in a color in the name because a lot of our favorite artists had that Black Sabbath Pink Floyd Blue Cheer Deep okay, Purple yeah. so there you go Orange Goblin yeah. was, was <laughs> and you you've like you've kept many releases through the years and uh one thing that like amazes me is pretty well all the same members over that what are you is it about 30 years now of course that yeah it'll be 30 years next 30 year years next year and i mean me chris and joe have been there pretty much the whole way through martin our original bass player he left in 2020 yeah and we recruited harry armstrong and prior to that we we were a five piece we had two guitarists but pete left in 2002 i think he was after the first u.s tour yep. he came back a little bit jaded from that and sort of said i've, I've done everything i wanted to do yeah um left and we didn't bother replacing him and find another guitarist we, we just wanted to stick with the one guitar yeah because we figured you know our favorite bands like sabbath and motorhead were, were fine with one guitar so so yeah, why, why, why should we be and uh that was the coach i mean joe's a great guitarist anyway he can do what rhythm guitarist is doing as well as his leads as well so it it, it made sense yeah yeah totally totally so last time you were here was 2013 Soundwave. is that right correct yeah yeah so it's been you know a good 10 years since we've been down there yeah and Soundwave. Soundwave was a really good introduction because it gave us the opportunity to perform to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, there were huge, huge shows, huge crowds. Um, we got really well received and it was kind of like a flying busy way. You, you just arrive in one city one day, do the festival, stay in the hotel and then go straight to the airport the next morning to do it all again. And this is going to be very similar to that in the, you know, it's five shows in five days, five States. Yeah. But, we we kind of prepared for that, but what we are excited about this time is that these are specifically Orange Goblin shows. You know, doing Soundwave is great, but you can't really get up close and personal with the crowd. There's a bit of a distance at festivals, and yeah, at this yeah. time, they're smaller venues. 
the crowd is specifically there to see Orange Goblin and we get a longer set and yeah, we're looking forward to meeting the fans and, and having a bit of fun. Yeah. So do you you like the club shows better than the, the festivals or you like both, I guess? But... I mean, you know, festivals serve their purpose. So they're, they're great fun and they're, they're a great place to meet people and hang out and they're, they're great for bands that, are, you know, you, you want to get your your music across to, to 20, 30,000 people in one go, then yeah. bosh, that's it, you've done it. But for me, the bread and butter of, of what we do is is the clubs, club shows, the smaller venues where, you know, the sweat's dripping off the walls and yep. people are a bit rowdy. And, and yeah. Yeah, there's no separation between band and audience. It's, it's what it's all about, I think. Yeah, and you know they're, they're there for you or, you know, for maybe the style that that is for that yeah. night yeah you know they're there for that so that's good so yeah. new album on the way uh what can we kind of expect um any anything different or anything you kind of stand out stuff you want to say i think it's uh i think it's the most mature orange goblin album you can tell that you know we're all sort of around our 50s and uh yeah we're, we're better musicians we're better songwriters Yep, yep. Uh, a bit more of an idea of what we're doing in the studio. You know, when we did that first album back in '96, we we were like kids in a candy store, just yep. sort of running in. What does this button do? What does that do? Let's throw some of this on there. Let's have some vibra slap and things like that. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, what the fuck? Vibra slap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, and now this time around, we had a pretty good idea. We was, you know, obviously it's been six years since the Wolf Bites back, so we've had a bit of a chance to think about it. The world shut down for COVID which uh, meant that the transition between Martin leaving and Harry joining was pretty smooth. And Harry brings a new element to the songwriting process as well. Yeah. So we actually did go into the studio to record this time with a really good idea of what it was going to be and, and, and how it was going to go. Uh, and I think you can hear that in the record. It's, it's really well produced. We worked with a really experienced producer called Mike Exeter, who's, he's Tony Iommi's main guy, really. He produced Heaven yeah. and Hell. He's, who's Dio, he's produced, well, he worked with Rick Rubin on the last Black Sabbath album. He's done, uh, you know, a lot of great stuff and and came highly recommended. And as soon as we sat down and spoke to Mike, we knew he was the man for the job. And yeah, he's done a fantastic record. I think people will be really impressed with the production on this record. Because it, you know, it's clean and it's crisp and it's clear, but it also maintains that kind of grittiness and the heaviness that, that, good 70s and 80s rock and metal should have yeah, so yeah. um but yeah it, it ticks all the boxes um other than that you know it, it sounds like an orange goblin record there's still the core yeah. influences of sabbath and motorhead um there's little bits of everything you know we've, we've never been afraid of, of mixing it up and trying to incorporate you know where we all come from whether that's punk blues 70s rock southern rock uh, straight up metal, death metal, uh, thrash. There's there's bits of everything in there. So, yeah, we're excited for people to hear this one. Yeah. So with with your writing process, how do you kind of because you guys are located kind of all over England, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. So how do you kind of approach um, your writing? Well, obviously, in the old days, it used to have to just be <clears throat> when we got together in the studio and, and jam sort it of out put ideas. Together. And what we do, we, we kind of have, you know, nowadays it's a bit easier because you record to your phones and you can send them to each other via WhatsApp or whatever, and you can hear what each other's coming up with. Yeah. But essentially what we do is Joe and Chris, Harry, they they each write riffs, and then we get together in the studio and it's kind of like putting together a jigsaw, saying, oh, that riff is going to work well with that one, this yeah. one will work well with that one, and then making them songs, fleshing them out. And as soon as we get this kind of, the skeleton of a song, then we start to add bits to it, say like a mid late there, a pre chorus there, and, and then I'll start to get ideas about vocal melodies and lyrics and, and what the what sort of ideas that the music conjures in my mind to accompany with the lyrics, and uh, that that didn't really change on this album. We 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 still did it how we always have, but it was just nice and kind of exciting and fresh that it'd been so long and, and having Harry's input that, um, you know, we were, we were all kind of excited. Um, I would say in the past that we've always kind of left it last minute. We're one of these bands that 
don't really pull our fingers out until we've got a date in the studio and we, we know have we to. have to get them. Yeah. But, um, you know, this time we put a bit more thought and effort into it. We actually rehearsed quite regularly. We had a few days uh, down in Brighton doing pre-production in the studio where Mike actually came and joined us for a couple of days. Okay, He was like a fifth, mem fifth member of the band. He made some suggestions about, you know, the structure of the songs and where we could sort of do things a bit different. And that was nice. It was kind of something we'd never had before. Um so yeah, to me, it's just a really well-rounded record, and and uh, it's it's a step a step up in every aspect. I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can't wait to hear it. And you guys have signed to Peaceville Records yeah. as well, which so. is you know that's a that's a big big thing for me because as I say in those early days we were heavily influenced by all the bands that Peaceville were putting out, the My Dying yeah. Brides and Aphrodite. Paradise Lost and you know I've been a long time fan of bands like Autopsy and Dark Throne and they they yeah, work yeah. with and they're still signing you know good young talent here in the UK bands like Hell Ripper from Scotland oh, yeah, and, yeah. and it's an exciting an exciting label and since we delivered we've had a couple of meetings with them and they're enthusiastic they're excited about the record and I think they're going to give it the attention that it deserves um, it's nice to have that from the label straight off the bat. You yeah, know, when they yeah. get it, they 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 want to do something with it. They they want this album to chart. They want to push, you know, four or five singles, videos, things like that. And and that's nice for us because it it's like you know we've delivered a, a child to them, and, uh, yeah. and they're going to take care of. It. Yeah, yeah, which is yeah, you you can't ask for more than that, can you? Exactly. Yeah. So you um you work as a a booking agent as well, um, okay, and you yeah. book a like a myriad of different things, but you also book all your Orange Goblin tours and yeah, yeah. I mean, I I kind of fell into this. Um, you know, I I worked at a management company for ten years prior to becoming a booking agent, and um, I was in the office working with a guy called Paul Lowesby who manages David Gilmore and the Pink, Pink Floyd and Sid Barrett estates. And, and uh, that was kind of useful for me because I think in the early days as a musician, we were all kind of naive about the music industry and how it worked. And we just thought it was like we were getting on a bus and going and have a jolly up with our mates for six weeks going on yeah. tour. Yeah. Didn't realise what the financial implications were. And, <laughs> and it's a lot of hard work. work. Yeah. And, um, you know, so being in management was good for me. And then I kind of left that job in 2012 to go and do Orange Goblin full time, which is when yep. we came down to Australia to do Soundwave. And we spent a couple of years touring really hard. And uh, I think 2012 or 13, we did something like 161 shows that year. Yeah, wow. and it was grueling. And unfortunately, you know, the style of music we make, they, they, they weren't financially viable for us to continue. So at the end of those couple of years, I had to come back and find a job. Yeah. And I was uh, I was approached by what was then called the agency group about becoming a booking agent. I was like, with your experience, you've worked on the management side, but you've been in a band that's toured the world. So you must know all the venues. You must know the promoters. You must know the festivals. And I was like, yeah. And, you know, I, I know how to do a settlement sheet at the end of the night and that sort of thing. And I was like, well, you know, would you want to come in and work in our rock and metal department here at the agency group? So I, I accepted that job. And then within a the year of it being, being there, it had been bought out by UTA, United Talent Agency, one of the biggest booking agencies in the world, yeah. talent agencies. And, uh, you know, um, I had a good five years there. And then during COVID, I left there and I set up my own business, Route One Booking, which is what I'm doing now. And, yep. you know, luckily a lot of my clients that I had at UTA wanted to work with me and came with me. And, you know, now I have a roster that boasts not only Orange Goblin, but the likes of Voivod and Fu Manchu and, oh, you know, wow. countless yep. others. It's, yep. uh, it's a strong roster that I work with and it's, it's something I enjoy doing. It's, it's, you know, I'm lucky that I can work from home. If, if yeah. COVID taught us anything, it was like, you yeah. know, we, we have this ability to work from home. So here I am, yeah, running my own business and, and uh, things are good. <laughs> That's great. That's great. All right. Well, um, thanks so much for your time with me today. I'm I'm going to go see you guys. Um, Sydney, I'll be there okay, to see well, you guys. Well, 
Yeah, come come and say hello. It'd be good All to right. catch up in person. Yeah, nice that'd one. be great. That'd be great. Um, I guess one last question just to to finish it off. What I always like to ask um, for younger bands coming through now, kind of in the rock and metal realm, yeah. um, and younger members too. What what kind of what do you kind of suggest for them to do? Still do the hard yards, kind of like what we did, or it's it's obviously different. Yeah. But, um, I think so. I think you know the the key thing is to be in it for the right reasons. And if you're in it for the right reasons, then you're in it for the long haul. Be prepared to take some knocks along the way. Be prepared to, you know, not always get the results you wanted. Get the uh, get the response you wanted, whether that's from the media, whether that's from the audiences. You know, you you got to be prepared to uh, to keep going and pick yourself Learn from up them. when you. Yeah, and. Um, you know, a lot of bands these days, it's it's a lot easier because you've got the internet and you can create albums in your bedroom with Garage Band and things like that. And yeah. and you know, publicising yourself is a lot easier these days. You know, it, when we first started, it was still tape trading, and we had to write letters to magazines, and we had to go out to shows and dish out flyers and give away cassette demos and things like that. That's right, yeah. Which which seems to have fallen by the wayside. But I think that those things are really character building, and yep. they forge friendships that are you know useful to us throughout our career and still we maintain those friendships to this day with people that have helped us and you know you just believe in what you do believe in it and then yeah. if, if you know that you you shouldn't be in a band if you don't believe in what you do anyway if, if you know yeah, I I, we started Orange because we wanted to create the music that we love and you know if, if you if you want to make money then you're in the wrong industry because you know the, there's no money in rock and roll. Go, but, go work for the yeah. government. <laughs> yeah, unless unless you, unless you get lucky. But um, you know, Bon Scott said it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All right, yeah. thanks, Ace, for your time, and uh, I'll see you in Sydney. Nice one. Cheers, Dave. Have a good day. See you later. Bye bye.